it was like there was a meeting between me, God, and Pastor Marty, and he was preaching, and I'm sitting there in tears, and I just said, okay, God, you can have it all. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 33 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And it is the sixth in the series of How Were Your Barriers Removed? In this episode, we'll find out how Jay barriers were removed when he came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes, no matter how great the selection, you just can't find exactly what you want. Design it yourself, custom gift baskets solve that problem by allowing you to choose the specific products you want to include with your unique gift basket. And in addition to hand selecting the products, you can further personalize your custom basket by adding coffee mugs, stuffed animals, mylar balloons, or even an imprinted ribbon. When you're done, We'll put it all together in a one-of-a-kind, perfect basket and ship or hand-deliver it directly to your lucky recipient. Click in the description section to design your basket today. Jay Harriet, welcome to the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you, MCG. I appreciate you and Jay having me on the podcast and looking forward to uh, a good discussion. Great. Before we get into your testimony where you were born and all this stuff, you started a charity called the 25th Project. Tell me about it. Give me a brief history about this project. Uh, the 25th Project, we actually started feeding the homeless in 2002. On uh, Thanksgiving Day, I had run five miles. I was sitting at my desk working and got hungry, went to Boston Market and saw that they had a meal for eight. And it was just me. My girls were with their mom that holiday. And so... I was like, okay, I got to do something. And I saw that Boston Market had a meal for eight. So I went and bought the meal for eight. I drove downtown, found seven homeless guys and had Thanksgiving with these homeless guys. And I thought this was a pretty cool thing to do. So then again, I did it again on Christmas. And so every Thanksgiving and Christmas, I did it just those two days out of the year. You know, several years later, 2008, 2009, I started seeing the same people on Thanksgiving and Christmas every year at the same spots, same volunteers bring in, you know, a ham sandwich, turkey sandwich, a bag of chips and a little oatmeal, little Debbie oatmeal round and a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that's not really Thanksgiving. So that's why we did a hot meal and we serve it hot to the homeless uh, on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I thought, you know, who's helping these guys in March or July? And so then in August of 2010, I was looking at the calendar. Thanksgiving fell on the 25th. Christmas is on the 25th. And my old boss and mentor said, if you don't have a date on the wall, nothing gets done. And so mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm in IT. And I figured, oh, we'll call this thing the 25th Project. And the 25th of every month, we go out and do stuff to help the homeless. Then throughout the year, we have themed monthly events like March. We have an Irish stew. April, we do food trucks. May, we do a cookout. June, we do a fish fry. July, we have a movie night. And so those are the events throughout the year. And then Thanksgiving and Christmas, we have a much bigger presence. Like Thanksgiving uh, 2020, we did 2,100 meals. Fed a lot of homeless people throughout the D.C., uh, Virginia, and Southern Maryland regions. And then Christmas Day, we did uh, 1,425 meals. And this was all during the pandemic? All during the pandemic, yeah. And so we had this great guy that joined the team in March, and he's a chef. And he couldn't cook anywhere because the restaurants were closed and his place where he was working closed. And so he wanted to cook. And I was like, well, we can make meals. And Chef Mike made 1,800 meals from April till just before Thanksgiving and then on Thanksgiving, we, you know, it's a whole bunch of people that come together. I think there was like eight or nine different churches of people that came on Thanksgiving Day over to Burke Community Church to put meals together. And then we take them out and distribute them to the shelters, to the homeless people that are in the streets and in the camps down in Northern Virginia. 
What's your ultimate motivation beyond the 25th project? The ultimate motivation is, you know, help our neighbors. You know, we have our thing with the 25th project is our slogan is to help the homeless close to home. Well, then you have to ask the question, how do you do that, right? How do you help the homeless close to home? The way we answer that question is by doing one thing, one day, one time. And so if you were interested in coming and helping us out and go, I don't really know anything about the homeless, then all I say is just come do one thing, right? So how can you help the homeless by doing something really small? Every February, we do collection of soup and socks. And so we get people to all over the country. People will sign up on our website, soupandsocks.com, and they'll go buy a can of soup, get a new pair of socks, put it in the bag, and on February 25th, they hand it to the homeless guy that they see on their way to work or on the way to church or whatever. And it's just soup and socks day. So it's really something simple. It's like $7.67 to go do that, right? Go get a couple new pairs of socks, get a can of soup, put it in a bag, tie it up, and give it to somebody. Mm -hmm. Soup and socks day. So it's easy. That's one thing, soup and socks. One day, February 25th, one time. We're not asking for you to do it every month. We're just saying, just give us one day and then let us know how it goes. You know, let us know what happens. So we're trying to help our, you know, by that little thing, it's huge to our homeless friends because there's days they don't have food. There's yep. days they can't get food. So it's a little tiny thing. Some people, you know, spend that much on in coffee in a day, right? right? So if they just said, hey, I'm going to do soup and socks or come out to our mac and cheese bowl in October or, you know, come do our fish fry, just do one thing. We're not asking people to do it every month. We're not asking you to do it every week. Now, I do it almost every week. I'm out there helping the homeless every week. But if everybody could do one thing one day, one time, it'd be a huge help to our community. You'd be able to make relationships with some of the homeless folks and we've helped out plenty of homeless people in fact i just came from helping homeless folks today they didn't have heat and so we got them a generator and we got them on a propane heater so that they'd have heat tonight they didn't have power and they have some extenuating circumstances but i took a generator over and took a heater over to them today so that they could have heat so that they could survive it was 38 degrees in their house oh wow and so we were able to help them out and get them going so that we can help them, help them to be able to go, okay, they're doing well and move forward in their life. And then ultimately you want to build that relationship so that they do have a relationship with Christ and that they do have heaven destination when they pass. You know, that's what we're supposed to do is to be salt and light throughout our community. Right. How can someone volunteer or donate? I think you mentioned a little bit about volunteer, but if I want to like donate, maybe money because I don't have the time to the 25th sure. project. How can I do that? People can just go to our website, which is www.t, the number two, the number five p.org. And that'll take you to the 25th project website. And there's a PayPal donate button right there. And people can donate if they wish. And if they want to volunteer time, there's an email there, info at the 25th project.org. And they can come in and, you know, it doesn't have to just be on the 25th. It can, you know, if 25th is on a Thursday, I think, in March. And if they don't have time on Thursday, I'd say, hey, come with me to another outreach on Saturday that I help out occasionally. And so, or we'll go do our own thing. You know, there's always, they want to help deliver propane. I do that a lot during the winter from, from November to March. Almost every weekend, I'm delivering propane. And the propane is how they're keeping their tents warm at night. And we started that probably six years ago. We had six or seven years ago, we had four of our homeless friends die. Oh, wow. Because wow. of hypothermia. And I just was like, we can't have that on our watch. We're going to keep propane going. And our largest expense is propane throughout the year. Yeah, I would and throughout, the, you know, throughout the winter months. Yeah, my wife is from Florida, so she doesn't like the cold at all. I would imagine that, you know, 38 in your house. Wow. Yeah, definitely. So, yes, people are asked if they can come help me out anytime. And I'm more than happy to work towards their schedule because, you know, I try to get them to come on the 25th because that's the big event. Right. right. But if they can't make it on the 25th and if someone's willing to 
help and volunteer, then I'll figure out my schedule so we can go do that together. Great. Thank you for all you do for the homeless, man. It's uh, other than hanging out with my daughters and all the stuff I've been involved in and done and, you know, taught junior church and classes and all that. It's by far the most rewarding thing I've ever done from a community service, spiritual stance and helping others with their walk and their faith. Yeah. Well, let's get into your testimony. So tell me, what state or country were you born in, Jay? I was born in Maryland. Then I've been in Virginia, the mean streets of Springfield, pretty much my whole life. Tell the listeners about Springfield, Virginia. Springfield, Virginia is just outside of Washington, D.C., about 15 minutes out of D.C. And, you know, I live in a regular residential neighborhood, good neighbors, you know, people looking after each other. I've got my neighbor next door. I look out for her, try to shovel her driveway, mow her grass. She's the best in the whole wide world. I love Mrs. Wang. She's fantastic. But, you know, we're supposed to be looking after our neighbors and doing stuff with them. Right. Yeah. Did you grow up in a family that was very much community and others minded? Tell us more about the type of family you were born into. My dad passed away when I was eight. And so my mom got remarried. My mom and my stepdad are awesome. I love them both. I love them to death. They just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary in July of 2020. I was a, you know, snotty nosed kid, punk. And then they put me in Christian school. So I went to Christian school and it was uh, there uh, while I was at Christian school. I think I was 14 years old and I think it was March 21st, 1982, was when I accepted Christ in my heart. A fellow named John Hansen led me to the Lord back then. And I won't say that I lived the Christian life perfectly. You know, who does? That's right. You know, I played church for a long time. My mom taught us to try to look out for, you know, our neighbors. I was cutting the neighbor's grass a lot as a kid and just kind of looking out and trying to figure out how we could do stuff in the community. So my mom, I'd say my mom, my stepdad helped me out with that a lot. And it's always been sort of in my spirit to try to help wherever I can. Do you remember the first time you actually heard the gospel? I know you mentioned you went to a Christian school. Was it after you were enrolled in that Christian school you first heard the gospel? You know, we went to church. You know, we went to the church up the street. I didn't really necessarily hear it like I heard from a Christian school perspective, right? And so it's probably fair to say I probably never heard it until uh, going to Christian school. That's probably a fair assessment. And yeah. then I was rebellious that first year, man. <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to do anything with it. You know, you're 14 years old, trying to figure it out, and where do you fit in the world? And you know, I didn't have the right friends my first few months that I was there. And then I, my sister, she actually gave me pretty good advice back then. She said she heard my folks talking and I wasn't doing well in school and I just didn't study. I didn't apply myself or anything. Right. And my sister comes up to me and she goes, you know, I heard them say, I heard my parents. She said, I heard them talking that if you screw up this Christian school, you're going to military school. And at that point, you know, I was like, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. I'm going to go this way. I got saved and got most improved students that year and all that stuff. So it was, uh, and so, I mean, that point of salvation is definitely a place where I feel like that was obviously a changing point. Then it's about discipleship. And, you know, and I would say I played church for a long time, long, long time, you know, and it wasn't really till, Maybe 2009, uh, I spent a year working overseas as a contractor and I came back and, you know, I had a bad breakup and was dating a gal for a while and we had a bad breakup and, and that was just a bad dark time for me. And one day I was like, I got to get back into church. And so I got back into church. I started looking around churches and I honestly, I went to Burke community and you know, Pastor Marty had only been there a few months and there must have been five, six hundred people there. And I'm telling you, MCG, I'm telling you, just as sure as we're sitting here, it was like there was a meeting between me 
God and Pastor Marty. And he was preaching and I'm sitting there in tears. And I just said, okay, God, you can have it all. I was like, I have screwed this up 15 ways from a Sunday. And you can have this. If you can make something of this, then all praise be to God. And, you know, just been praising the Lord ever since. What exactly was the Holy Ghost convicting you of during that meeting? To not be such a knucklehead, you know? I mean, I just made a bunch of bad decisions. And that was the point where the Holy Spirit just, you know, just, I won't say crushed my soul, but certainly I was under conviction of, you know, being a schmuck and not being, you know, being the type of person that I ought to be that shows Christ's light through their life. And again, I'm not perfect today, but I'm certainly trying to be a Christian that people can go, oh, okay, you've made some mistakes, but you know, you're, you're going this way now and trying to get the word out to as many people as I can and build those relationships so that it's something that is in the end, you know, you pray that God's honored and glorified by those decisions and actions that we take today. As you know, our podcast is called Removing Barriers. What did you think was the barrier that caused you to maybe go astray, didn't return sooner? What was that barrier that is in your life that you say, hey, this is what really prevented me from coming back? Uh, you know, my pride, I would say my pride was the thing, you know, I thought I was pretty hot stuff and my pride was the thing that was, that would have hurt things on a personal instance. Then when God strips you down, then it's, uh, that pride goes away pretty quick and there's no, you know, if you can just go, Hey, this is God and God's working it. And sure. I screwed some things up and I've been wasn't the right type of example. I let down some friends. I let down an ex-wife, probably kids. But, you know, I've tried to strive to be a good dad. And you'd have to ask my daughters if I've been a good dad or not. You know, you never really know. But we have a great relationship. They can talk to me about anything. I can talk to them about anything. And, you know, and trying to be... My old boss said, you know, you want to make your mom proud, right? right? And so... I would think now I hope that my mom's proud of the work that we've done from the 25th project. But aside from that, raising really good daughters and, you know, people I admire the most are probably my daughters because they grew up in a divorced household uh, with some challenges on both sides. And they've maneuvered those waters pretty well. One of them graduates from Bob Jones here in May. And then the other one is a sophomore, Bob Jones, and she's doing really good, too. So what's her major? The older one, her Marissa is social services. And then Leanna uh, wants to do hospital administration. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations on the graduation coming up. Thank you. You know, they're going to be serving the public somehow, some way. Right. And so I've tried to instill in them an attitude of being service minded. Their mom did a good job with that, too. And I think that they were able to grow up in an environment that, despite its challenges in a two-household environment, my house and her house, I think we did a good job. And I'm real, real proud of who they are as young ladies and Christians and followers of God. It's, it's cool to see them where they're at. And then I hope my mom's proud of, you know, whatever we're doing. So, yeah, I'd say the, you know, the pride, you know, you got to strip your pride away, you yeah. know, it's, take that pride away and just go, <laughs> This is God's thing. And the little fundraisers they did last night, that's all God, you know, doing that. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. We will be right back. Do you have the desire to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Answers in Genesis can help. They provide biblically sound books, CDs, DVDs, homeschooling materials, VBS materials, online courses, digital downloads, and The Answers Magazine, and more. Plus, tickets to the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter. Go to The Answers Bookstore by clicking the link in the description section below so you too can be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason of the hope that is in you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, 
all things are become new. Jay, after salvation, what changes were evident in your life? After salvation, hmm. there was definitely, you know, when you first, it's a good question, Jay. Thank you. After salvation, what were the changes? I mean, there was definitely a change for maybe not attitude, but maybe action. 14 years old, you walk around with an attitude problem, right? And I remember I was a pain in the neck to my folks. You know, you're trying to figure out, I think sometimes a new Christian gets left out there and they don't get that discipleship that you really need right. and that connection of community. And I think that's where, you know, you go, oh, you're a Christian. Okay. You know, you're in the club. And then what happens from there? That discipleship piece is really huge. And a friend of mine just accepted Christ a couple of weeks ago. And I'm trying to not let him be just floating out there, trying to figure it out on his own. I'm trying to be there and help him with questions. And I'm hoping to start a Bible study with him and be able to sit down and talk about, you know, what's the next steps in our Christian life here. Yeah, I think that's part of the Great Commission that get overlooked so often is the discipleship part. Because, you know, we go out there and we witness and we tell people about Christ. And they accept Christ, then we just leave them. Right. The Great Commission tell us that we should not only win them, but we need to disciple them so they can grow and not fall prey to the devil in that way. Yeah. It's, otherwise, if there was no reason for discipleship, then at salvation, God would take you home. Right. Right. Oh, he's a Christian. Here we go. Take him up to heaven. But, you know, he wants us to live for him and to be good disciples. We're all called to be disciples, and we're all called to be going and winning other people and telling people about Christ. I think a lot of times that people are afraid to share their faith in this area. You know, it's hard to do, but, you know, the more you get out there and just start talking and build that relationship, you have some really good, intimate discussions. You know, I have a lot of non-Christian friends. They all know where I stand. And you know, the first person they call when there's trouble, they call me. Yeah. You know, because they know something's different. And we've had discussions about what Jesus did in my heart. It just took a while for it to really take hold for me to really be on the right track. You know, but that's, I think what was missing was the discipleship piece. Yeah, definitely. Do you think the way your barriers were removed would be effective in the life of others? So let's say someone had a similar barrier in today's culture. Do you think the way your barriers were removed would be effective to help them? Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, our pride is what keeps us from and keeps us doing a lot of things, right? Right. Our pride keeps us from maybe sharing the gospel at work, right? Our pride may keep us from ever witnessing this somebody, you know, in the grocery store or at a homeless camp or something. You know, I think that you've got to relationally build. If you can build a relationship with that person, right, then you have a freer chance and a more honest chance to win that person by building that relationship first. Yeah, that's so important. I heard a missionary said once that, he was speaking about the, I think it was the Asian country. And he said in this country that you have to build relationship with people before you can actually share the gospel. And I remember thinking to myself, it's the same in the U.S. You yeah. really need to build relationship with people before you can, at times, before you can effectively present the gospel to them. Of course, I'm not really now going out door to door and present the gospel to strangers. But you can right. be so much more effective if you have a relationship with that person already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, relational is, it's huge. You know, this guy wouldn't have called me a couple of weeks ago if he didn't know we had a relationship, you know. And, you know, I'm just sitting there talking to him at his office. And, you know, he started praying right there. I didn't ask him if he wanted to pray. I just said, you know, if you pray and you accept Christ in your heart, right, and you say, God, I'm a sinner, I accept your son, his death and resurrection, as a payment for my sin, I accept you in my heart. I just told him that. And I didn't say, do you want to pray that prayer? I didn't do anything. He just started praying. And then when he said, amen, I just jumped right in and prayed right after. Amen. And I don't think I'll ever forget the words. He looked at me and he's like, 
I've prayed a few times. He's like, but I never felt anything. And he's like, I felt God here in our presence. And I've seen him every week for the last three or four weeks. I took a Bible to him the next week. And, you know, he's like, I'm reading my Bible. I'm really getting stuff from it. And, you know, how cool is that? Amen. Yeah. A lot of Christians go through their life without never really lead anyone to Christ or see the new birth. So when it does happen and you realize that you're the instrument that God actually used to lead someone to Christ, it's really an amazing experience. And of course, salvation is not based upon your experience and your your feeling, but definitely when the spirit moves, your spirit going to move as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. I'm still amazed, you know, and, you know, I teach a class at church now, a singles class at church. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what do we call ourselves? And, you know, some of us are, you know, if you think of clay pots, right? And, you know, we all got cracks and, you know, cracked handles or broken handles, chipped here, chipped there. You know, that's what our life is, is we have, you know, everybody's got scars and bruises along the way. And, but I just think it's so cool that God will give us that opportunity to serve him. You know, he'll call us back. The Holy Spirit will nudge and keep nudging and keep nudging like it took, you know, years and years for that to happen for me. But that, you know, that goes back to the pride thing. And, you know, when you finally just strip that away, then God can work. Again, I'm not the perfect Christian by any means, but it's so cool to see how God works, you know. And as long as we give him all the praise, honor and glory, you know, it ain't the J. Harriet show. It's God's show, you yeah, know, and God idea. working through us, you know. So in addition to the 25th project, and it sounds like you're also pitching in and reaching out to your neighbors and to friends, what are some other things that you're doing personally to help remove barriers like the one you faced in your life and in the lives of others? You know, when the pandemic started, that's a great question. When the pandemic started, we started, the guys from church, and I think there was about six of us that started just praying at 6 a.m. every day. And our saying is, every day that ends in Y is the day that we pray at 6 a.m. So every day, every single day since March 16th, there's been several of us that have been there every day since March 16th. But now, I think there was 38 guys on the call today, and guys from different churches, guys that don't look like, don't look like me, right? We've got black guys, we have Spanish guys, we have white guys that have all been on the prayer time. And that's been the transformative thing is this men pray, right? We call it men pray 2020. And, you know, so looking for that clear vision, right? And now there's guys that uh, we've had a couple of events where we've gone over to my buddy, Dan. Uh, He's got a farm on the eastern shore. I think we had 44, 45 guys show up. And just pray and just share there. So that's the a removing a barrier that I think is good for everyone is that we don't have we all go to different churches. You know, there's a couple guys that are pastors of churches and laymen and deacons and everything. And it's been really cool to see those barriers that have been removed from a lot of people's eyes. I mean, my best friend of almost 40 years is Darren and Darren and I went to school together, went to Christian school together and and Darren's black. I'm white. And we've been best of friends. I was talking to him just before we got on this and I would do anything for Darren. And so when the whole civil unrest thing came in and the racial unrest came in this last, I called Darren and I was like, dude, you got to help me out here because, you know, as far as having, uh, relationships with people that don't look like me, that don't have the same skin tone as me, right? right? Having that friendship of almost 40 years, I think this year is our 40th year of being friends, you know, is really cool because, and then in our group of guys that pray every day has been, you know, guys developing these friendships that probably never happened before, you know, and to see this group come together every morning so every day that ends in y we get together at 6 a.m on a zoom call like this and get together and pray for an hour and you know relationships people are 
laughing with each other. You know, we get on about 545 and start cracking jokes on people. And then our saying is 701, let's get to work. And so we try to call ourselves 701 men. It's like, we don't want to forget what happened in the last hour of prayer. And at 701, you click your brain on and you go to work and you don't think about it again until, you know, 559 the next morning. You want that. And I think people are encouraging one another and texting each other and calling each other more so than they ever did before. I can guarantee that, at least from our group. I can't say what anybody else is doing. I can say in our group, people are texting and calling and encouraging one another, which, oh, by the way, that's our job, (laughs) right? right? To encourage one another. And I think we just went over that in Hebrews chapter four, I think, last week in our Sunday school classes to encourage one another. Yep. So Hebrews, them all. Hebrews three thirteen, right? Right. You know, spur each other on, and so that's our job. And yeah, provoke um, each other on to love. Yeah, and I think that that's been a huge, huge part. Absolutely, I'm certain that men getting together to pray about whatever is going on in their lives would definitely create an environment where barriers come down. Prayer does change things. Do you have a favorite scripture verse that you always refer to, or maybe several verses that you always kind of fall back to and lean on? Oh, with Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, I have a plan for you. Mm-hmm. You know, I think is you know I always look to Psalms and Proverbs. I have a favorite book of the Bible, and I think for practical Christian living, you can't get any better than James. And when he starts the book of James. You know, James is the half brother of Jesus, right? You know, James starts out by saying James is a servant of God. And he doesn't say where he could have been boastful. He could have said, Hey, I'm James. Jesus is my brother. Mm-hmm. You know, but he doesn't say that. He says James is a servant of God. And I think if we all took that and said, you know, MCG, a servant of God, you know, J, a servant of God. And I think that those would be the things that there's really no greater thing than to be a servant of God. And I yeah, think definitely, yeah, I always go back to James. And so James is where I kind of really get into the scripture. Do you have a favorite Bible history? We say history, most people say story, but do you have a favorite Bible history that you like to go back to or like to tell? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> I think, What most resembles a lot of us would be King David. You know, you might get to some area of prominence and then you might screw the pooch in life. But, you know, God called David, you know, a friend of his. And so I think, you know, going back to David is I think a lot of us, us, me, could look at that and go, you know, you hope to be called God's friend, right? Right. Definitely. Greater love had no man than this, than a man laid on his life for his friends. Right. Definitely. What's the most convicting scripture passage to you? You talked about how James is the book that we go to for a practical Christian living and how David resembles pretty much all of our lives. What would you say would be the most convicting passage in scripture to you? You know, I would think the same thing. I think in the same line as would be David's life as far as, you know, David clearly made a few bad decisions along the way. But then there's that hope that what God has done for us, you know, that God loves us enough that even when we've sinned and we've strayed away from him, he brings us back to him, you know, and accepts us for who we are in a relationship with him. Yeah, there's so many applications we can take from it. One of the things that David did that always encouragement for me personally, is when he went out to battle and he came back, his wife and everything were basically taken from him. And not only him, but he was taken from all his men as well. All of them came back and their wife and kids, everybody were gone. And all of them turned against David. And the Bible went on and said that, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. Right. That's so much stuff that so many times that, you know, it's good to have someone else encourage you. But when you can encourage yourself in the Lord, That's always good. Then you can even look at David's life with Bathsheba, when he sinned with Bathsheba, and then how he returned to the Lord. If I should choose someone in the Bible to 
call them a man after God's own heart, I would not choose David. I would not say David, may look, that's a perfect example of a man right. after God's own heart. But that's how the Bible describes him as a man right. after God's own heart. So definitely. Yeah, I like it. That's good. That's good stuff. What's your favorite hymn of the faith? Do you have a hymn that you really like? Well, uh, yes. I have to think of the words to it. I'll have to keep thinking about it. It's, uh, I mean, I love Amazing Grace, right? I'll have to look up the title for it and I can get it for you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no problem. I assume the answer to this question is going to be David, but who's your favorite giant of the faith in terms of from the Bible? Someone in the Bible, you say, man, that's my giant. That's the guy I look up to. I assume that would be David again. Well, on that, I think it would be James. Okay. You know, because of how he starts that book. Right. You know, James, a servant of God. Uh, I think there's no pride there. Right. You know, and, you know, where we look at our life and if we have pride, you know, then we wouldn't say we're servants if we have a bunch of pride in our life. Definitely. Right. Yeah. I think James would probably be the giant. How about someone outside that's not in the Bible? Is there a Christian maybe in your church or someone you grew up observing that you say, man, I would like to be a Christian like that person? There's several. And there's several giants that I have. In fact, on my phone, they're called the squad. Okay. And so, and the value, I think there's a lot of value in that because when we have a group that are trusted, like trusted that you go, I can tell you anything that's going on in my world to pray for, to encourage, to whatever that is. I think that my squad of Dan, Harry, Chuck, Paul, you know, those guys are my squad. Harry, Dan, Chuck, Paul. And where we have, that's the squad. And if something's going on, then I want to be able to reach out to them and go, hey, I need prayer for this. And I think it's been very valuable. And I really look up to those guys. Interestingly enough, Pastor Todd made a big impact on me one day. I don't know if I've shared this with him. I'll share it now. So Pastor Todd, he was, I was at a volleyball game and my kid was playing. And Pastor Todd, I don't think he knew I was watching him as he was walking around, but something was on the floor and he went over and got the broom himself and the dustpan and he cleaned everything up and then went and put it back. And I just thought that that servant leadership, right. you know, he could have went and told three other people say, Hey, there's a mess on the floor, go clean that up. And they probably would have done it, but he went and did that himself. It's the smallest little thing, but it was that servant leadership, that quality that he had. And my guys that, uh, you know, I attend church with at Burke, my squad, those are all guys that I look up to in the faith. Yeah, definitely. We all need someone like that. We all need someone in our corner that we can get some advice, get some encouragement, whatever it may be. We definitely mm -hmm. need people like that in our life. Can we go back to the song, 10,000 Reasons? Okay. I've never heard that one. I'm going to look it up. Look up Celtic Worship and 10,000 Reasons. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, that's an awesome song. I'll text you a link. Okay. All right, definitely. Yeah. Jay, thank you for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you so much, MCG. Appreciate that. And Jay, your lovely bride, thank you for having me. I certainly have enjoyed the time. I enjoyed the conversation. And hopefully we can do this again. It'd be awesome. Yeah, Thanks definitely. So much. Definitely look up the 25th project. Look into it. And if you can volunteer some time or, or money definitely would encourage the listener to do that yeah and just do one thing one day one time so you know jay jay harriet mentioned that pride was his major barrier to salvation it's amazing how many people have that barrier to salvation how many doors have been closed because the person was too prideful to listen or how many invitations were turned down because of pride. The Bible declares that in Proverbs 16 and verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and a hearty spirit before a fall. And in Psalms 10 and verse 4, the Bible says the wicked 
through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Is the pride of your heart preventing you from turning to Jesus Christ in repentant faith? May I encourage you like J. Harriet did and turn to Jesus Christ. Do not let your pride take you to a Christless eternity, a jaded place called hell. Would you instead repent of your sins by calling upon the name of the Lord and be saved? And spend eternity in heaven with your Savior? The Bible declares in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's pride preventing you from being saved today. The Bible declares that you can be saved, but you don't have to give up that pride, just like J. Harriet did. You would have to repent of your sin, that sin of pride, and turn to him. Would you trust him today? Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us or to support this podcast, go to anchor.fm forward slash removing barriers. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.